Whiteson, and I'm a professor of Jewish studies at Penn and also the director of an institution called the Cat Center for Advanced Today Studies, which is the organization that has uh, organized this event. And it's really a pleasure to welcome you today to an afternoon that's going to combine music, learning, and a little mysticism. So thank you all for coming. For those of you unfamiliar with the Cat Center, just let me say a word or two about what it is. Um, the mission of the Cat Center is to advance our understanding of the Jews and the culture. And one of the ways we do so is through a fellowship program that brings to our community about 20 scholars every year from around the world to explore a particular theme or issue in the study of the Jewish people. This year, this current year, our focus has been the study of Jews in modern Islamic context, in places like Iraq, Egypt, North Africa, Turkey, and other places where Jewish life was shaped through encounters with Muslim neighbors. It is a privilege to have uh, a, a wonderful array of scholars in our midst this year. And over the year, we've tried to share them with the broader community through public programs like the one we are about to experience right now. Today, we're going to be using music to explore other times and other places. But of course, we cannot completely leave the day and age in which we live. The mosque attacks in New Zealand, following the shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue here in Pennsylvania, the Charleston Church shooting in South Carolina, and other attacks against houses of worship have brought religious communities together in moments of sorrow and fear for the future. And as we hope this program reminds us all, this is not all that our communities share in common. Jews, Muslims, and Christians also share traditions of religious longing and joyful communion. I am grateful for this opportunity to learn about and celebrate what different religious communities give to each other. I have two brief messages before we get started. The first is to ask everyone to take a moment to silence your cell phones. It's very important. And the second is to offer some brief thank yous. Today's program, like all our public programs that the CAT Center offers, was made possible by the generosity of the Platt family and the Harris Stern Family Foundation. We are very indebted to them. We're also very thankful to Ann Albert, the CAT Center's director of public programs, um, for organizing this program along with many others over the course of the year. She works together with the center staff to make this, po to make this possible, and we're exceedingly lucky to have such wonderful people working on behalf of the CAT Center. I also want to express my appreciation to our co-sponsors, the Middle East Center at Penn, the Jewish Studies Program at Penn, and our great resource, the Old Pine Street Church. Uh, three exemplary Penn students have stepped in to help us out, Reem al Arabiya, Daniel Halak, and Muhammad Gulabi, and I want to thank them for coming to our help, and I also thank them for being wonderful students. And finally, I need to thank Penn's Police Department and the Philadelphia Police Department for their efforts to keep us safe and bring us peace of mind. The scholar who conceived our, this afternoon's program and who will be our guide is Professor Edwin Sarusi. Professor Sarusi is the Emanuel Alex Alexandre Professor of Musicology and the Director of the Jewish Music Research Center at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He also happens to be a CAT Center Fellow this year. Professor Sarusi is one of the world's leading musicologists and a scholar of Jewish and Israeli music in particular. Just this last year, he was awarded the Israel Prize which is Israel's most prestigious honor in recognition of his pioneering work in the study of the musical cultures in the Mediterranean and the Middle East. As you will see in a few moments, he's also uh, a true embodiment of the ideals of humanistic tradition. He's deeply learned, inexhaustibly curious, perceptive, witty, open-minded, and open-hearted. And it has been a blessing to have him in our community this year. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming Professor Sue. Good afternoon. I don't intend to lecture to you today in a formal academic way, so I just want to provide some background as to what you're about to hear and listen, because that's the main reason you came this afternoon. Uh, however, um, I am extremely, yeah, okay. There is no microphone. So my first, okay, my first observation will be that this is an acoustic performance. 
It's a rare opportunity for you to hear music as it really sounds and not as it is mediated by technology that usually creates a gap between you and the musicians. So be attentive, and if you pay enough attention, you will be able to hear very well. And I hope that now you can hear my voice, okay? Uh, when uh, we speak about the Jews and Muslims, regretfully, the public image today is the image we get from the news, an image of confrontation, of conflict, perpetual uh, uh, violence, and regretfully, I have to say, because this is not what the whole story is about. And most important to know is that for a time, since the rise of Islam, a vast majority of the Jewish people lived under the dominions of Islam. And this sharing of spaces also developed into a sharing of ideas, of aesthetic sensibilities, of science, of poetry, etc. And I think that this is a basic lesson that we have to remember. And the concert today is just one demonstration of that sharing. Moreover, the Arabic language was a crucial language of Jews, not only in the daily interactions with the Arabic-speaking populations, but also in their scholarship, in their learning. Basically, Arabic can be considered a Jewish language, too. That's another point that is important to remember. Poetry being a basic component of Arabic and Islamic culture in general is also a basic component of Hebrew culture since biblical times. And poetry developed particularly since the fifth, sixth century, first in the Byzantine uh, Empire before the rise of Islam, and later on, most specifically in Muslim Spain, in Hebrew, according to patterns, forms, and meters that are very similar to those of Arabic poetry. Later on, there were encounters between Hebrew poetry and Persian and Turkish literatures, which also belong to the sphere of Islam. And therefore, we have this content interaction between Jewish and uh, non-Jewish uh, poetry within these vast uh, realms. Mysticism is another important issue that we raise today in this uh, concert. Mysticism uh, is an absolutely integral part, organic part of the religious experience, and therefore there is no surprise that mysticism is shared by Judaism and by Islam. However, what is important to remember is that the mystic experience is an experience that is not mediated, is an inner experience. And here we introduce music as a main instrument in the way of enhancing the experience of the mystic. Therefore, poetry, music, and the mystical experience are an integral part of Judaism and Islam. In Islam, mysticism is known under the banner of Sufism. In Judaism, sometimes people confuse the concept of Kabbalah with mysticism. So Kabbalah and mysticism intersect in many, many, many points. But I want to say, for the sake of clarity, that not all of the Kabbalists are mystics, and not all of the mystics are Kabbalists. So uh, uh, just to make uh, sure that today, when we speak also about those concepts in the framework of postmodern spiritualism, that we should be aware about the uses of these uh, concepts. But basically, uh, the uh, expression and the uh, induction into a mystical state 
of consciousness through the recitation of poetry and its performance with music, and in many cases, including dance, became a staple of both Jewish and Sufi, uh, Jewish mystical and Sufi uh, circles. Now we move into more closer into focus. I'm just trying to focusing more and more in our concert. We are speaking today, we are listening today about music and poetry within the realm of the Ottoman Empire. Therefore, we are here for an encounter between Turkish Islamic culture and Jewish culture. This encounter is relatively more modern. It starts to pick up, as we know it today, from the 16th century onwards. And certainly, it's a very special case, case of sharing spaces since, generally, the policy of the Ottoman sultans was of leaving each ethnic and religious community within the empire to conduct their own businesses in relative freedom. You just have to pay taxes. That's very important. So in this framework and in the exquisite culture of the palace of the Sultan of the Seraglio of Topkapi, and in other venues in the big cities of the empire where most of the Jews resided, we have a very close musical interaction. And the concert of today then ties together all those points. Mysticism, the mystical experience, the religious experience within the Ottoman sensibilities aesthetic sensibilities. And we are going uh, to hear uh, several aspects of this interaction. And besides the program notes that you have, I am going to introduce some of the pieces uh, one uh, by one. I just want to say, uh, and this is my final general remark, that what we are witnessing today on the stage is a phase in the development of these musical and poetic traditions that has to do more with the present state of this music. That is to say, it's mostly mediated through the stages. It's much more rarely performed in the original context in which the music was performed. What I mean is that the original context of most of the music I'm talking about the Jewish part of it, not about the Muslim part of it, is within the framework of the synagogue and the Jewish home. The poetry was performed mostly uh, with this music, mostly in special sessions that we call, among scholars, paraliturgical sessions, that is to say, prayer events that are not normative, that are elective, that usually took place traditionally in the very early morning of the Sabbath. People used to rose to the synagogue around 3 AM and sing these songs until the sun came out and the morning prayers started. That was one event in which this music was performed. But <clears throat> the music was also performed in other events, such as family occasions, circumcisions, weddings, etc. So these frameworks today were extremely weakened by displacement, immigration, loss of religious observance by many Jews uh, in Turkey. So what we have today is the last remnants of uh, the great Turkish Jewish community, mostly in Istanbul today. Uh, and uh, a few synagogues in Israel that attempt and try to maintain this tradition alive. However, this tradition is very much alive in the archive. And the archive becomes a mediator between the memory of this music and its reenactment for the sake of what it's today a little bit more of an aesthetic experience. So, Basically, if you look at your program notes, you will see in the, in the design of the cover, in the design of the cover, you see the great synagogue of Edirne. 
Edirne in uh, uh, European Turkey, in the, in the European uh, part of Turkey, actually is a city just in the triangle between Bulgaria, Greece, and Turkey. Uh, it's a key city in the musical tradition of the Jews of the Ottoman Empire. This ex very big synagogue constructed in the early 20th century, this great sanctuary under the sensibilities already of European architecture, uh, was <clears throat> in a very bad shape, almost destroyed, and it was rebuilt by a project of the Turkish government and reopened a few years ago for access to the public. So that's the synagogue that I would say was like the musical academy of the Jews in the Ottoman Empire. Many of the members of the choir of this synagogue became cantors in the different communities of the empire in the late 19th century and early 20th century. And besides that, you see a musical score. This musical score is part of the collection of the great cantor from Turkey, Isaac Algazi, that I had for historical reasons that I won't go into detail, the great uh, honor of being the recipient of this collection. And one of the first pieces that you're going to hear is written in this, uh, is part of this manuscript collection. However, the musical, the Western musical notation was not written down by the Jewish performers of Istanbul of the time in which these manuscripts were made in the 1920s, 100 years ago about now. Time runs by. In my previous lectures, I used to say 70 years, then 80 years. Now it's 100 years. And, uh, and they were made by a very famous uh, Armenian Christian composer, because the Jews did not write did not know how to write music. So here you have an Armenian Christian composer writing Hebrew poem set to Turkish music performing the Presbyterian Church <laughs> in Philadelphia. It's just for you to be aware of the complexity of what, what we are uh, experiencing. So before I go into the first section of the concert, I will tell you that the concert consists of three sections. The first section is sung a cappella without musical instruments and reconstructs the sound of the synagogue, particularly the choir from Edirne. This choir went with the name of Maftirim. It's a very old name of this uh, choir that today is applied to most choirs that sing this repertoire. But this word was particularly associated with the city of Edirne. So the first part is uh, uh, totally uh, a cappella. Uh, the second and third part, we will have a short intermission because we have to set up the stage for the instrumental section. The second and third part I will introduce after the intermission. The first part, uh, as I said, is vocal. It will be introduced with a vocal taksim. It's a vocal introduction of a few verses from the Bible that used to open all the um, 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 de devotions of this uh, choir of Maftirim in the city of Edirne. And they are performed by our master, our musical director, Mehmet Sankilor. Then we will move into a poem by Rabbi Israel Najara. This is the poem that is uh, written in the music by this Armenian uh, uh, composer. The, I should say a word uh, about uh, Rabbi Israel Najara, who is a crucial figure in the musical tradition that we are going to hear today. And by the way, this is the subject that I'm working on as a fellow of the uh, Katz uh, Center. Uh, he lived in the second half of the 16th century and first two decades of the 17th century. He was or is considered one of the most outstanding Hebrew poets of the early modern era. He composed about a thousand poems. And his poems were published partly during his lifetime in three different editions. As I said in one of the seminars at the Katz Center, very many contemporary poets would like to have their book published three times during their lifetime. And we're talking about a period where the printing press is at 
brand new technology. So that tells about the demand for this poetry. And the demand for this poetry was based on the fact that it was all set to music that the people knew at the time. So every poem has the musical instructions as to which Turkish, Arabic, Judeo-Spanish, or Greek melody have to be sung, because Najara commanded these four musical repertoires. That goes for multiculturalism that is usually considered a modern invention, but we are talking about the 16th century, a pretty multicultural empire at that time reflected in the music of Najara. By the way, we also know that Najara was a composer because in pieces that he doesn't quote another song, he says the melody is by me. Then uh, we will move into the student or one of the main disciples of Najara, Aftalion ben Mordechai. This man wrote even more than a thousand poems that most of them are not printed to this very day. They are all in manuscripts, in Hebrew manuscripts. Uh, he lived in the late part of the 17th century and was considered by the Turks as a very important musician. musician. They call him Kuchuk Oja Aftalion, that is to say, the little master Aftalion. And uh, finally, uh, we move into the last two pieces, which bring us to creativity in Hebrew poetry and music almost into the 20th century. The first piece, Kezerem Kabir, uh, is a composition by a great Jewish composer of the early 20th century, Moshe Cordova, who also had the privilege of finding his archive of musical notations from his only nephew in Tel Aviv. After 20 years of searching for this legacy that I knew that existed, we have the opportunity to retrieve and to work out and to present to you a composition based on those musical notations too. The last song, Hadesh Kekedem, is one of the very well-known songs from the Maftirim repertoire. Uh, this one and a song that we're going to hear towards the end of the programs permeated into the Israeli repertoire, so they are also considered Israeli folk songs. Nobody knows that these are Maftirim songs that come from Turkey. How this got into the Israeli repertoire, that's a story for another lecture that I cannot get into it now. But it's a fascinating story of the encounter between the Turkish Jewish immigrants and singers in Tel Aviv in the early 20th, uh, 20th century. The only good uh, opportunity that I have here to, to correct myself, which is what a scholar should do all the time. When we did this program in Boston for the first time several times, uh, the poem was written by Chaim Bejerano, who was the, one of the chief rabbis of Istanbul at the beginning of the 20th century. Because the poem has the acrostic Chaim, that is to say the first letter of each stanza gives us the name of the poem, the name of Chaim. However, I was with the wrong Chaim. And my good friend, and I will give him credit, Dr. Dova Cohen, one of the great experts of Turkish uh, Jewish culture, and an expert on Izmir, he found the original manuscript of Rabbi Chaim Abuab from Izmir, and today I can correct my, uh, my, my own program notes. So we are hearing a composition by Rabbi Chaim Abuab. This is all what we have for now. I just uh, want to, I won't repeat all what uh, Steve uh, just mentioned, all the thanks, but certainly I want to give in my name and in the name of all the members of the ensemble uh, our real thanks to the Katz Center for Advanced Jewish Studies of the University of Pennsylvania for their hospitality, for their support for this program, and particularly to Ann Albert for all the magnificent organization. We work on this for several months, and we are really, really moved that you are with us here this afternoon in Philadelphia to celebrate this Jewish-Muslim encounter. Thank you very much. And I invite my friends.
Yeah. 
Ja ganz ruhig. I thought that you will like uh, to know a little bit more about the instruments, about the musicians. So we'll have a little dialogue before we go into the third and last part of uh, our program. Uh, without entering now into a class of music theory, of Turkish music theory, two basic concepts that you see in the program that you may be baffled by them. So the first concept uh, which is crucial to this music, the concept of makam, which basically for the sake of brevity, we will put it as musical scales of Turkish music. It's much more complicated by that, but take my word that thinking about scales is a good beginning. So we have arranged these three sets, the first, the second, and the third, in a series of makams that have a certain sense of moving in musical terms from one scale to the other in a much more um, or, organic uh, uh, way. Um, which leads me to a very brief uh, note that we changed during the rehearsals the order of one of the pieces because the order of the scales was too much difficult to go from one to the other, so we changed the order. I will tell you in a minute. Besides that, uh, I would like uh, to uh, point out that the pieces that we're going to hear in this uh, last part, each of them has a very special story. And it also has to do with the methodology of research, with the sources, the use of the sources, the renewal of the sources. The first piece is extremely interesting. It's the real only piece in the program that you're going to hear Turkish classical music from the court of the Ottoman sultans in the early se um, 17th century. Yeah. In the early 17th century. You will immediately notice that it's a different style of music. It has a different uh, aesthetic. Uh, and you can feel that this is the music of people who knew how to live. And they have time to meditate over very long periods of music that today we don't have the patience. And the, the poetry is by a contemporary of the great composer who composed this piece. So the composer is Dimitri Kantemir. He was a Moldavian prince that was taken prisoner, or so to speak prisoner, by, by, the, by the sultans, like a friendly prisoner. And since Dimitri, this Dimitri, one of the, uh, he's today one of the national heroes of Romania, uh, he was a professional musician, he knew musical notation, so he wrote down all the repertoire of the, of the court, of the Ottoman court, and also he became a composer and one of the most distinguished ones, so he also wrote down some of his compositions. His contemporary was a Jew, Rabbi Aaron Amon, known by the Turks as Yahudi Arun, that is to say the Jew Aaron, one of the many musicians and poets who served in the Sultan court. And Arun, this Arun or Aaron, left us musical manuscripts, and in the musical manuscripts he has the Hebrew text, and he wrote down to which piece of music we have to sing. So what we have done here for the first time, as far as I know, is to put the text of Arun under the music of Kantemir that he knew. And we can hear this piyut, this Hebrew song, more or less as it was sung about 200 years, or 300 years ago, let's say 300 years ago. So this is the first, uh, the first piece. Then we have two pieces that are uh, a uh, world premiere this uh, afternoon for, uh, for Dunia, for the ensemble Dunia. And we wanted to include some Judeo-Spanish in this program, because the original program did not have Judeo-Spanish. So we have uh, two pieces that we inverted the order. We will start with El Dio Alto, which is a very famous piute in Judeo-Spanish, a religious song in Judeo-Spanish, sung in Avdala at the very ending of the Saturday in the ceremony marking the ending of the Shabbat. We sing, we praise God, asking him for all the goodness for the week that is about to start. And since today is Sunday, it sort of fits the day today. Uh, 
And then it will be, uh, we will follow with Rabbi Hanania. There is in the middle a vocal improvisation by our singer uh, in very classical uh, Ottoman Turkish uh, style. And then we'll move into Rabbi Hanania, a very interesting piece performed by Joe, and I will introduce Joe in a minute, uh, which is the opening of the closing. Is the closing, the closing of Pirkei Avot. It's the closing of the reading of Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the father and read in all the Ottoman Jewish communities between Passover and Shavuot, between uh, Eastern and Pentecost, okay, in Christian terms. So uh, this uh, tractate from the Mishnah of, is divided in six chapters, and there are <coughs> six uh, Shabbatot, six Sabbaths in the middle, and every uh, uh, Shabbat, after the prayers, they perform with this very ancient tradition of uh, one chapter of uh, the ethics of the father. And Joseph is going to perform that. He learned that from the cantors in Istanbul very recently. So we have really the voices of Istanbul through the agency of Joe here in the concert. And then towards the end, we have two uh, very um, uh, uplifting uh, 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 pieces. The first one is uh, Yehemel Levavi, another poet, poem by Rabbi Israel Najara, the great poet of the 17th century that I was mentioned before. It's set to a piece which originally is an instrumental piece. It's uh, like an overture to the Ottoman concert, and it's called Peshrev. The Peshrev is instrumental. And the Jews who wanted to perform this music in the synagogue in the Sabbath, and they are re refrained from using instruments on the Sabbath in the synagogue, they just put words and perform the piece with words only. So this uh, specific piece, I have an anecdote that I always tell, and I always, in a way, synthesizes the spirit of this concert. One of the great Makam Jewish masters uh, of the last generation, the Reverend Samuel Ben Arroyo of blessed memory. He was cantor in Istanbul and he left Turkey in the 30s. Eventually he settled in a city called Seattle, Washington. Can you imagine <laughs> this musical memory from Istanbul ended up in Seattle where I had the privilege of meet the Reverend Ben Arroyo and learn from him singing these Maftirim songs. Uh, 50 years after he left Turkey. And he told me here in Seattle, they don't let me do this heavy stuff. So he was very happy that a young man from Israel came and was interested in him. But he told me something very interesting regarding this piece. In the 1980s, the University of Washington hosted uh, some of the best musicians from Istanbul. This, I think, uh, Bob, was one of the first times that major masters from Istanbul came to teach here in America. And they had a concert. And the concert opened with this piece. And the Reverend Benaroya told me, you know, I told to my wife, I said, look, they are playing our music. <laughs> because he didn't know that the origin is this uh, instrumental piece. And they thought this is the music of the Jews because the Jews sing it in the synagogue. So here you see that all boundaries are uh, broken. So uh, my uh, final notes, I hope I'm not doing this, is to introduce our musicians and their uh, uh, instruments. And uh, it is uh, such a pleasure to have this weekend with these uh, friends. The concert is just a little detail in a wonderful weekend of work and singing and practicing, which is the great pleasure of the musicians. The Dunya Ensemble uh, from Boston uh, was created many uh, years ago. And as I said, I had the opportunity to collaborate with them uh, in several uh, occasions. I will start, actually, according to the age, if you allow me, Bob. And Bob Lavare, uh, my dear colleague and ethnomusicologist, and he is the one, I think, who recruited me and linked me to the Dunya Ensemble uh, when I was in Boston. And I am so happy uh, to have Bob. Uh, Bob, uh, and Bob is playing a new ins instrument that you will tell us how many there are in the world and a little bit about the story of it, this instrument. Let me think. And please. One. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Speak loud so that the people won't complain. 
th there's, this is really the, a one-of-a-kind instrument. It's a, it's a re reconstruction, in a way, of the classical Ottoman harp that went out of business, basically disappeared. That is to say, nobody played it anymore after about oh, 1700 or thereabouts. So it's a, it was, but even a generation before, there were well-paid Cheng players on the, on the Sultan's, uh, his payroll. So, and there are composers who are named Chengi and so on. The difference here is that it's a harp, but what we did is we added a, a um, my collaborator, Ferdinand Özgüren, who's a, uh, an instrument maker in, in Boston, put on a, we put on a bridge, like an oud, and we put the tuners from the, the kanun, which is a sort of zither-like instrument in Turkey and in the Arabic world. Um, apparently, the, the, that invention came along too late to save the Chang back in the 18th century. Because if it had had it, it would have been able to keep up with the changes that were happening in Turkish music, that is the ability to change modes in the middle, to modulate, and so on. So that's what we can do. Thank you. Uh, our musical director and master, one of the most distinguished Turkish musicians, not only in America, but in the world, a teacher of us. Thank you very much, Mehmet Sankulol. Uh, he plays an instrument which is not so unusual, but still something about the wood. Right, sure, why not? It's a, a fretless instrument, it's a short-necked instrument, and um, I guess one thing that may be uh, familiar to you is that uh, this instrument looks like the uh, early European lute, um, because an ancestor of this, not, not this version, but an ancestor of this instrument was uh, also the ancestor of the European lute. And so the Arabic proper name of this instrument is al oud. So if you say it a couple of times, al oud, al oud, al oud, al oud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, um, I, I'm playing this, but also I'm playing, <clears throat> you'll hear me play um, this instrument too, the ne. Um, and um, uh, there are several different sizes of the ne. I happen to be uh, playing a shorter size uh, in today's program. Uh, but um, it's basically, when compared to um, really any instrument, the, the santur or the chang or the oud, um, this is just a piece of cane with seven holes and, and a mouthpiece. It's, it's very simple when, when you compare it to the kind of uh, craftsmanship it, it, it takes to build these other ones. So many instruments in, in uh, the Middle East, and in, particularly in Turkish music, went through an evolution, but not necessarily the ne. Um, I'm not here to answer as to why it didn't. I may have some thoughts about it. Uh, but one thing I'd like to share with you is that the ne, uh, in Turkey especially, uh, is the emblem of the so-called whirling dervishes, the mevlevi dervishes. And the first uh, several uh, lines of uh, the, the, the famous mystic poet uh, Jalaleddin Rumi, his seminal work Mesnevi begins, opens with the story of the reed, where he likens this reed flute to human spirit. So um, that's why this instrument holds a very important place in Turkish Sufism. And, um, I guess these are the two instruments that I'll be playing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, our uh, percussionist, uh, George Lernis, uh, he comes from us to, from Cyprus. And uh, George, when sure. the instruments that you play. Sure, I have two instruments with me today. Um, I have a bender in Turkish. Uh, it, all it is really, it's a frame drum. And, uh, this is really also an ancient drum. Um, I think it dates at least, three, it's 3,000 years old, at least. Uh, you can find it, uh, references of this on iconographies, on sculptures, and I think you can also find this in different cultures, like uh, shamanic, um, you know, um, in China, mid the Middle East. And uh, this particular one has a synthetic skin, but traditionally uh, they were made with calf skin. And um, I have an... Uh, 
Turkish darbuka with me and I say it's Turkish because the difference between a Turkish darbuka and an Arabic darbuka is that the edges are sharper and the, uh, this actually has a calf skin too, just a traditional skin on but the difference between going back to Arabic and Turkish is that this one you play with finger snaps instead of regular like finger hits. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our singer Burju Gulek, which I had the opportunity to meet only this uh, weekend. Well, I don't know if she wants to say something about her instrument, but her instrument is the most important one. <laughs> and uh, and we are uh, so grateful for you to uh, join us and also to learn uh, songs in two different languages, in Hebrew and in Judeo-Spanish and to teach us to sing in Turkish, which is uh, amazing. So thank you, so thank, much you for thank you very much. And uh, uh, our final distinguished artist, a member of our uh, uh, CAT Center for Advanced Jewish Studies, uh, Joseph Alpar, which uh, I could almost call him doctor, but he just needs one more Almost signature, <laughs> but he's there. He just passed his comprehensive exam, but, and, uh, yeah. So Joseph uh, uh, became a, a master of the instrument that he's going to introduce, but uh, what's it's more important is that Joseph was in residence in Istanbul for two years, writing his dissertation about the remnants of the Jewish community in Istanbul, particularly their synagogue music. So we have also a direct, as I said, source of information about what is uh, going on. Joseph, you want please to say something about sure. your sun tour? This is the sun tour, which is a kind of zither that uh, you play with hammers that has many relatives uh, all over the world, in, in Greece, in Romania, in uh, China, and of course here in the United States. Uh, the hammered dulcimers, uh, uh, ubiquitous uh, instrument in folk music. Uh, this particular one comes from Greece, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, the santur, like the Cheng, had a, its heyday in Ottoman music uh, before it was uh, uh, usurped by uh, louder instruments. Louder instruments, <laughs> exactly. So, but I'm trying to be loud today. <laughs> <laughs> this instrument is extremely. Uh, hard to uh, tune. There are so yes. many st strings and they don't hold very well, so you need to be working very hard on the tuning. And those of you who know klezmer music, you recognize the symbol of klezmer music, and this is why I always teach that klezmer music is mostly Ottoman music, <laughs> instead of the other way around, presenting as European music. But that's also for uh, another lecture. So uh, our previous set was marked by the influence of the Bektashi order. The, the Sufism is organized around the figures of saintly figures, of religious leaders, and the, each order gets the name from the uh, founder of uh, the order. And uh, this, this last set is on, uh, in the spirit and also on the music of the Mevlevi order, which is the, one of the largest orders in the Ottoman empires. That was also the order that most of the sultans belonged to. So the musicians who composed religious music were also the musicians of the court. So we have this, again, this fluidity between what we call the moderns today religion and secularity, which in that environment really didn't was, was not meaningful. So here we have the Meblevi order, and as uh, Mehmed already said, the Meblevi order is also a product of Turkish tourism, because that's the, uh, what is shown uh, to many tourists, the whirling dervishes. But uh, the real uh, events are usually close to the public in general, and uh, we are trying to reproduce a little bit of the spirit of the Meblevi Ain, that is to say the Meblevi ceremony, religious ceremony, mixing Hebrew and Turkish and Judeo-Spanish. Thank you very much.
Amen.